Good evening, Chapel family, and any others who happen to be watching. Um, a few announcements before we get started in John 14 this evening. Um, this will be my last study in John for a few weeks. I'm going to take a break. Um, I started a class for Northwest University on the Gospels a week ago, and I'm pretty behind in my grading. Uh, I've got a lot of work to do for customers, and uh, my wife and I are going on vacation. So we're going to start up again and uh, finish the Gospel of John uh, starting the first week of September. I um, also want to remind you about the chapel services this next Sunday. Uh, we did have the FM uh, transmitter last Sunday, and we had cars that came to listen. We had a pretty good attendance in the 1030 service. Um, so, uh, but, you know, stay tuned on the chapel website for any, uh, you know, late breaking developments there. So we're going to be looking at the first uh, short section of chapter 14. And I'm going to go ahead and read uh, just the first four verses there. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. So last week we began the upper room, what's called the upper room discourse, or the farewell discourse, um, which began in 1331, um, which started with a discussion of Jesus's glory. And we mainly focused in on the topic of Jesus's uh, new commandment to love one another. Um, the chapter 14 division here, uh, like often in, in some books, uh, the, the number 14 kind of obscures the the connection with the previous context. Uh, and so sometimes you need to be careful of that. Um, modern editions, which have headings over certain paragraphs, dividing paragraphs, having spaces, uh, even verse numbers sometimes, it kind of takes away from seeing connections and contexts that might be important to, uh, to understand the passage. So, uh, why does Jesus say, uh, don't let your hearts be troubled? Well, because of what he had just uh, said in the previous verses. Uh, they are troubled in heart. And uh, just as Jesus was troubled in heart uh, in the previous two chapters there, and it's using the same word uh, for being troubled there in the Greek. So they're troubled because, uh, for one, one of the disciples is going to betray him to the Jewish authorities. So Jesus reveals that. Um, secondly, Jesus has just said that he's leaving them. And uh, where he is going, he says they cannot come, uh, which must have been kind of mysterious to them. Uh, you know, Jesus, we've been hoofing it all over Palestine with you. Why is it we can't come where you're going? Uh, and then thirdly and finally, Jesus says that Simon Peter is going to deny him three times, uh, despite Peter's assurances to the contrary. So that leaves them very troubled, and Jesus says, don't be troubled. Um, and so the first section there, Jesus preparing a place for his disciples uh, in order to console the troubled disciples in regards to his imminent departure, Jesus gives a reassurance and a hope of a future reunion. Now, this particular passage here, uh, particularly verse, uh, verses 1 through 3, uh, have often been used in funeral services uh, to comfort those who are left behind, uh, to give comfort about the fate and the future of their deceased loved ones. But John uses a series of terms here. Um, my father's house, many rooms, a place, and a way, um, which all kind of uh, need to be unpacked. And those words often have a variety of important biblical precedents, uh, connections to the Old Testament, uh, various parallels. And so it, you can't really read this passage and kind of reduce it to John talking about some single point of reference like heaven. 
um, although that's very natural to do that. Um, the surrounding context and Old Testament allusions permit uh, a variety of nuances, and uh, those nuances uh, are not necessarily mutually exclusive. So the first thing that we encounter is temple imagery. So when Jesus says, my father's house, um, the only other place that appears is in the Gospel of John. We don't find that in the Synoptic Gospels. And my father's house earlier in the Gospel, in chapter 216, of course refers to the temple, uh, in the story of the cleansing of the temple, where Jesus says, stop making my father's house a marketplace. And so the temple in Jerusalem um, was considered kind of an earthly model, uh, a human-built model of God's dwelling place in heaven, God's temple in heaven. And the Jerusalem temple was always understood as the place where, where heaven and earth kind of meet, where they combine, where humans meet God, uh, where heaven comes down to earth. And so we have to think about how this might sound or read to uh, John's uh, original audience, who are mainly Jewish. Uh, Jewish believers in Jesus uh, because they're living in a period in which they're being forced out of their own places of worship, out of the synagogue, uh, which is mentioned three times in the Gospel of John. And also, you know, only 20 years earlier, John's uh, readers knew that the, the Jerusalem temple had been destroyed by the Romans. So it's very natural for John to address not only the disciples here, but uh, also address, address anxiety and questions about physical places in relation to the continued presence of God with his people. Um, if you read the book of Acts, of course, we know the early Christians, Jewish Christians, still met in synagogues. They still met in the temple. Paul, even later in his ministry, would still visit the temple. That's where he got arrested. Um, and so, you know, you can see on the right there, there's a, a quote from John 11. Uh, if we let him, Jesus, go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. And the word place there refers to the temple, uh, which it could also, in our passage, when Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. Um, and also earlier in the gospel, this was a topic of interest uh, with his discussion of the woman in the well, where he you know, is talking about the theology of what's the best place to go worship. Is it the, uh, uh, the Samaritan temple? Is it the Jewish temple? And Jesus says, no, I mean, there'll come a time when you're going to worship the, the Father, not at this place or any other place, but in spirit and truth. And it's interesting that later in uh, the book of Revelation, uh, John has a very similar theology of heaven and earth meeting and becoming one, uh, which is reiterated in the final vision of the new Jerusalem, which comes down from heaven to earth, uh, where it specifically states, I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord uh, God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. So there again, it's about presence. It's not so much about place. Um, and even in Psalm 23, 6, in the, in the quote box there, and I shall dwell, David says, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever, which is uh, just a way of saying, uh, I will be in God's presence forever. So then we come to the issue of, of how we understand the idea of um, many rooms or many dwelling places. The NIV has rooms, the NRSV has dwelling places, so it could be translated in a variety of ways. And this is where uh, many of us probably have been influenced by tradition um, and the mental imagery that's evoked by certain English translations. And one of the difficulties here is that the Greek uh, noun that John uses here is very rare. It's only used twice uh, in the New Testament, and it's only twice uh, in this chapter. So uh, that makes it even more important to consider the immediate context uh, and the use of the term uh, a few verses later in the same chapter. Um, and so the word mone um, can be translated as dwelling places, rooms, abodes, um, 
And it's, it's actually the noun for the verb meno, to remain or to abide. And this is an important verb in the Gospel of John, which we'll see uh, in the later chapters where it talks about abiding in Christ or remaining in Christ. <clears throat> so when we look at that, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the translation there, John 14, 1 and 2, uh, do not let your hearts be troubled Believe in God, believe also in me, or it can be translated, you believe in God. Um, some translations have it as an imperative to, to believe in God, or it could also, the same word, the tense, can be indicative, and you can see that in your translations. Often it'll have a footnote at the bottom. And, and for me, I think it makes more sense that Jesus is saying, you already believe in God, don't you? Um, because they're all Jewish. Um, obviously, they believe in God. They're monotheistic. Uh, but here Jesus is emphasizing, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places, rooms. If it were not so, would I, I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And many commentators have noted the, the parallels here with a passage in Deuteronomy where Moses is speaking to uh, the Israelites who are in the wilderness and about to enter the promised land. Uh, Deuteronomy 1 says, Do not be alarmed, neither be afraid. You did not believe the Lord your God. So kind of a contrast with what Jesus is saying here. Who goes before you on the way to choose a place for you. So it's as if Jesus here in John is like the new Moses. Um, so the second place where that word, that rare word is used is in John 14, 23, and the quote there is on the sheet. My father will love him, and we will come to him and make our dwelling or home with him. Okay, so you have two different ideas here. And uh, one seems to suggest, you know, that uh, he's preparing a place for us, that we're going to him. But here, later, the same word is used in the sense of, of the father and Jesus coming to us and making his home in us. So a lot of us have been influenced by the King James translation, which has uh, the word mansions. Um, in my house, I've heard many mansions. And, uh, and so I just wanted to kind of uh, do a little bit of a background of that translation. Uh, and I did talk about this, uh, those of you who are in the Romans class, we went over this passage. Uh, there. But uh, English translations of the Greek word monai. Um, so the origin of the English translation mansion um, comes from the King James Version of 1611. So when we think of mansions, uh, you know, we tend to think of very glorious kind of estates and houses. Uh, the picture on the sheet there, I've got a mansion just over the hilltop. In that bright land where we'll never grow old, right? Some of you probably really like that hymn. Uh, or you think of Tara with uh, Gone of the Wind, uh, the great palatial um, mansion. But that's actually not what the word meant even in the King James um, translation. So mansion was just a house. Um, it was a, a place to stop and to rest. It wasn't used in the sense of a palatial mansion. And we talked about, last week we talked about the importance of word studies, uh, looking at the historical development of words. So where did the King James translators get the word mansion? Um, they got it from Tyndale's earlier translation, almost 100 years earlier, uh, in the Middle English. That's what ME stands for, which is mansions. And where did Tyndale get it? Well, Tyndale got it from the Latin translation uh, which has the word mansio, which means a halting place, a stopover, an inn. So it's kind of a, a stop or a stage on a journey. And uh, I put a little quote there from the Dictionary of Greek and Roman Antiquities. The Latin term mansio, a post station at the end of a long day's journey, is derived from manere, signifying to pass the night at a place in traveling. On the great Roman roads, the mansions were at the same distance from one another. So there were these like way stations uh, as you're taking this long journey and you're gonna stop at this inn or this mansion, uh, but you haven't reached your destination yet. And there may be a sense in which our passage is, is using this word, 
uh, as kind of a temporary place, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, there's a good quote then at the bottom about this. Uh, when we unpack the metaphor of 14.2 then, we should think not so much of rooms in God's house, much less mansions as the AV or the authorized version 1611 has, but of the privilege of abiding in God's presence. When Jesus said, I'm going to prepare, prepare a place for you, we should not think of him returning to heaven and having arrived there, setting about the construction of rooms for his disciples to occupy, a task he has now been occupied with for some 2,000 years. Rather, we should recognize that it was by his very going, by his betrayal, crucifixion, and exaltation, that he made it possible for us to dwell in the presence of God. So where does that leave us? Uh, as we turn to the back, I kind of have a preliminary summary there. Um, amidst all these swirling traditions, all these backgrounds that we're looking at in the Old Testament and words and translations, uh, it seems best to see the passage as being primarily about the restored presence of Jesus with his followers, or his disciples, after being separated from them. But then that brings up another important question. Um, what kind of separation or when are we talking about here? Is it the separation occasioned by his death or that of his ascension and return to the Father? Does the promise that Jesus makes, I will come again, in verse 3, refer to the resurrection, the second coming, which in the New Testament often uses the word parousia, it's kind of the technical term, or does it refer to the promised coming of the Spirit, which is an important tradition that uh, Jesus is going to talk about in the next sections. Um, and it's interesting that that uh, phrase, I will come again, uh, this is the only place in the New Testament uh, where it uh, refers to the idea of Jesus coming again. Uh, although it will reappear later in the Nicene Creed, uh, where it says he comes again in glory to judge the living and the dead. Uh, matter of fact, the New Testament actually never even uses the phrase second coming. Um, it does use the word parousia, which means coming or presence or arrival. So what do we make of that? Um, it's not so easy always to separate the various ideas that we come across in John's Gospel. And he's routinely kind of blending the present um, and the future. And he talks about the inauguration of God's kingdom in Christ uh, and the benefits that come with that, but also anticipation of the future consummation of the kingdom. So perhaps we're not meant to resolve the tension uh, between dwelling places to which we go in the first part of our passage uh, and the promise of Christ and the Father coming to dwell with us. Uh, might be similar to what Paul says in Colossians, uh, where he says we're seated with Christ in the heavenly places. So with John, as we've mentioned before, there's always kind of this now and not yet kind of connected to each other. There's this age and the age to come, and you can't, can't just completely separate them um, with, with what Jesus has inaugurated. Um, then John talks about Jesus as the way to the Father. And uh, I wrote down the, the next section as 14, 5 through 14, but we're just going to go through verse 11. So I'm going to read 5 through 11. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you for such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the father. How can you say, show us the father? Don't you believe that I am in the father and that the father is in me? 
The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. So Jesus refers to this concept of the way and the way to the Father. And his statement that the uh, disciples know the way to the place he is going um, draws a very kind of characteristic question, kind of skeptical question from Thomas, who we'll know later as Doubting Thomas, although I'm not sure that's very fair to Thomas. Uh, but he's quite logical. He says, Jesus, if we don't know where you're going, how can we know the way? Um, you know, if you're with someone traveling and uh, and they say, hey, get your uh, GPS on your phone out and, uh, you know, just type in a distance, uh, type in, uh, try to find the directions, and he hasn't told you where you're going, uh, you know, you're going to be a bit confused. You need to know an address before you can uh, find the route. You need to know the destination. And so this kind of sets up for the fifth I am statement. Uh, there are seven I am statements with predicates in the Gospel of John. Uh, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And, you know, as we read through the Gospel, uh, there are various passages where, you know, the disciples are confused. And we see this in the Synoptic Gospels quite a bit, too. They, they don't really completely comprehend who Jesus is and his nature and what's going to happen to him. Uh, they all have very preconceived ideas of what a Messiah should do. And so if we think, oh, I wish I could have lived back then so I could, you know, understand better, you know, who Jesus is, uh, they didn't. <laughs> uh, they're often as puzzled uh, by him as, as sometimes we are today. But uh, here Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And it kind of reminded me of, I mentioned I grew up in the Jesus movement era uh, when we had this uh, sign, you know, one way sign. Uh, Jesus is one way. Uh, which we'll talk about. So this is not only one of the, the most well-known I am statements, uh, but it's also one of the most controversial uh, because it's very, uh, it's very exclusive in its, its, its words. Jesus is declaring himself as the single point of entry to communion with God the Father. But such a bold affirmation is not really unique in the overall Christology of John's Gospel and it's not really unique even when you look at the Synoptic Gospels. Um, so if we look at some of these, uh, some of the words and the phrases here, uh, Jesus and the narrow way. Um, this is something that has come up <clears throat> already in the Gospel of John, earlier in chapter 10, where Jesus claims that he is the gate for the sheep. And anyone who tries to get in to the sheepfold without going through him is refused entry. Right? It's a narrow way. You can't get in any other way um, except through Jesus. And this is very similar to a statement that we find in the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus says, enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is narrow, and the way, again, it's the same word in Greek, hadas. Uh, sometimes in your translations it'll be translated road or path, um, but I want to keep the connection here to the word way. Uh, it's the same in Greek. Uh, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and there are few who find it. So notice the parallels there with the Gospel of John, gate, way, life. Um, and the theme of the way is, uh, that leads to God is very prominent in Scripture. Uh, we have it in a variety of, of different contexts and places in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So in the wilderness wanderings, um, you, we were already read earlier the Deuteronomy passage on the front of the sheet where it talks about God preparing the way for the Israelites. Um, we have John the Baptist who is preparing the way for the Messiah with a uh, connection to Isaiah chapter 40. Um, we have the way as one of the first names that's given to the early Christians in the book of Acts. So there's several times where the, the early Christian community is called the way. 
And uh, there is another tradition of two ways, which is based on Psalm 1, which became very popular uh, in the early Christian um, tradition. And so we have books that are written uh, very close to when the Gospels were written, uh, like the uh, the book of Barnabas or the, the Didache, the Teaching of the Twelve, uh, which are written kind of late first century, early second century, which have these traditions of the two ways, um, the way of life, the way of death, uh, the way of light, the way of darkness. And you can see there, even in the, the wisdom literature, a couple of quotes from uh, Proverbs and Psalms, there is a way that seems to be right, but in the end, it is the way of death. Or Psalm 32, 8, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. The other thing, uh, obviously, that uh, this I am statement <clears throat> reveals is Jesus uh, is the sole revealer of the Father. And as I've mentioned before, uh, John uses the word Father um, 118 times in his gospel. Um, there's nothing like that in the Synoptic Gospels. And in chapters 13 through 17, the Upper Room Discourse that we're looking at, um, he uses the word Father almost 50 times. In chapter 17, uh, in the what we call the High Priestly Prayer, uh, Jesus uses it as a direct address. And he says, Father, as he's praying to God the Father. And John is constantly emphasizing the close relationship between the Father and the Son, which builds on the opening of the prologue. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. And so when Thomas here says, show us the Father, uh, Jesus says, well, I am here to show you the Father. Uh, I have incarnated myself uh, to show you what God truly is like, what God the Father is like, and that everything you can envision or think about, uh, God the Father is something that's visible in Jesus. And so John seems to here consciously present Jesus in the manner of a Jewish tradition, which is called um, the Shaliach. And this was a designated representative or a messenger with the full authority and power of the one who sent him. I mean, John's readers growing up in this Jewish rabbinic tradition uh, would be familiar with that word and that, that uh, characteristic. In the rabbinic tradition of the Shiliach, the one who is sent is like the one who sent him. And a man's agent is equivalent to himself. And there's a quote about this uh, there. Because the Shiliach, Shiliach may act on behalf of the one who sent him, when one deals with the Shiliach, it is as if one is dealing with the one who sent him. Jesus is presented in the gospel against the backdrop of the Jewish concept of agency, and furthermore against the understanding that there is one chief agent through whom God acts. And as you can see on the inset on the screen there, I, I uh, put together a few verses and, and examples of this uh, from the Gospel of John, where Jesus is presented as God's agent. Uh, Jesus, as the Word, shares in the creation with God the Father. In chapter 1, all things came into being through him. The Son faithfully represents and acts according to the Father's will. John 5.19 says, Whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. Jesus exercises the divine prerogative of judgment. John 5.22 says, The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. The Son shares in the life-giving power of the Father, as well as the authority to give eternal life. John 5.26 says, For just as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. John 17.2 says, You have given him, the Son, authority over all people to give eternal life. <clears throat> the Son shares in a unity of purpose uh, 
in authority with the Father. John 10.30 says, The Father and I are one. And then a few verses later, The Father is in me, and I am in the Father. Finally, the Son shares in and reveals the glory of the Father. Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. And there are quite a few other examples we could put of this, but these are all expressive of what we call John's high Christology, that Jesus shares in the divine identity of God. And uh, it's interesting that uh, 19 times in the Gospel of John, uh, Jesus is said to give what he receives. So what he receives from the Father, he gives. So that's an important connection. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, finally, third, uh, Jesus and the problem of postmodern truth. The overarching scriptural story of creation, fall, redemption, renewal, those are uh, often the, what's called the four acts of the biblical drama. And if we were to encapsulate the biblical story into four um, acts, creation, fall, redemption, renewal. Um, that story in the Bible claims to be a truth that is relevant to all people in affecting the whole of the created order. Now, when you get to the Enlightenment period of the 17th and 18th centuries, um, and particularly the postmodernist movement of the 20th century, uh, those movements call into question these assumptions, and they challenge the idea that there can be a single, what we call meta narrative, an overarching story, a uh, meta narrative that covers everyone, which applies to all people everywhere equally. To many people, Jesus' statement of exclusive access to God and truth, I am the way, no one comes to the Father except through me, sounds extremely presumptuous and dismissive of other faiths and traditions. We call this exclusivism, um, which is different from pluralism. N.T. Wright describes the response well. How dare he, people have asked. How dare John or the church or anyone else put such words into anyone's mouth? Isn't it the height of arrogance to imagine that Jesus or anyone else was the only way. And we even see kind of this postmodern um, expression uh, in the Gospel of John itself uh, in chapter 18 after Jesus is arrested and brought before Pilate. And Jesus says to Pilate, For this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And all Pilate can say is, what is truth? It's a very good postmodern question. <laughs> Who's got the truth, Jesus? Um, well, the core of this issue is, is there one creator God? I mean, if there is one God who created everything we see and everyone we see, um, to whom do we owe allegiance? To whom do we owe service? and worship. Um, there's a good quote there from Miroslav Wolf, a very prominent theologian, who talks about this idea of pluralism. What is John's relation to religious pluralism as a normative stance? Pluralism means that uh, you know, all religions basically lead to the same place. They're all equally uh, relevant. John will have none of it. Of course, John advocates neither the use of violence nor the employment of political or social pressure to reduce religious pluralism. There are no traces of the will to impose by force the one true religion on others. Only signs of resisting others' attempts to forcibly limit the Jehannine community's free exercise of religion. <clears throat> 
And in that way, uh, John is similar to Paul, who in 1 Corinthians 5 uh, says, look, what business is it of mine to judge outsiders? There he's only concerned with the ethics and morals of the church and keeping these uh, boundaries within the church. So it's none of my business to judge non-Christians or to expect non-Christians to hold Christian standards. He says that's ludicrous. Um, and so Wolf goes on, John is less interested in negating other religions as ways of salvation than affirming a particular person, Jesus Christ, as the universal Savior. The claim, no one comes to the Father except through me, is a consequence of the claim that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, not the other way around. Some form of exclusivism is the only game in town, meaning the only game in town, uh, especially according to the Gospel of John. Now, as we think about the ramifications of this passage, um, I kind of want to go back to this, this idea of uh, preparing a place, um, the word monet, rooms, dwellings, um, which could, if we take it as, a, as an intermediate place or a, 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 a temporary place, which the word can mean, uh, it might imply theologically what we call the intermediate state. So we're with Jesus when we die, uh, but then, of course, we are expecting something further. And it's important to emphasize that the idea of a permanent disembodied state or some kind of spiritual existence alone in heaven uh, would be in tension not only with John, uh, because he talks about the importance of the physical creation, creation of all things, the incarnation into flesh of Jesus, uh, God so loving the world, the cosmos in the Greek, uh, the resurrection of Jesus, getting his body back. Um, so, you know, the idea of spending, you know, the rest of your time in some spiritual state in heaven is, is certainly not a biblical idea. And uh, the final chapter of the biblical story is the story of Emmanuel. Um, is God with us? not us with God. And uh, I used to use a textbook uh, in one of my classes, Creation, New Creation, uh, at Trinity Lutheran College, and students had to read this book by Michael Whitmer, uh, Heaven is a Place on Earth, Why Everything You Do Matters to God. And in the very first chapter, very first uh, paragraph, Whitmer says, I don't want to go to heaven. Not that I'm lobbying for the other place. I'd love to go to heaven for a visit. It will be unspeakably exhilarating to stand in the presence of God and sing his praises. But to do nothing except this forever and ever? That's a lot of rounds of shine, Jesus, shine. As wonderful as it will be to praise God in his celestial glory, there is still one thing better to kneel in the presence of God with the bodies he created us to have in the place he created us to live. This is why our temporary stay in heaven, what theolog theologians call their intermediate state, is not the primary focus of scripture. There are only a few verses that even allude to it. Scripture is relatively silent on our intermediate state in heaven because it is not the Christian hope. The Christian hope is not merely that our departed souls will rejoice in heaven, but that as 1 Corinthians 15 explains, they will reunite with our resurrected bodies. And where do bodies live? Not in heaven. That's more suitable for spiritual beings like angels. Bodies are meant to live on earth, on this planet. So the Christian hope is not merely that someday we and our loved ones will die and go to be with Jesus. Instead, the Christian hope is that our departure from this world is just the first leg of a journey that is round trip. We will not remain forever with God in heaven, for God will bring heaven down to us, as is expressed 
in Revelation 21, with the New Jerusalem coming down from heaven, God with us, Emmanuel. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you are with us. We thank you that you are close to us. We thank you for the promise uh, that we will read about soon of the comforter, um, the paraclete, the other comforter that will be the, the replacement for the physical presence of Jesus with us. We thank you that you're always with us and we are with you. We thank you for the story of Jesus and the life of Jesus and what he has done to uh, make us in connection with you. We, uh, we ask that you help us to understand the big picture, the meta narrative, uh, the story of creation, fall, redemption. And of course, we're waiting for that glorious renewal of our bodies in a permanent, eternal life with Christ in your good creation. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.